Hello, hello, and welcome to Hometown Daily, the new show powered by hometown.com. Today is June 3rd, 2024. It's season three, episode 155. I am Marwat, and above me is the visualizer for the sentient AI. Let's see if it's working. Good evening, Hometown citizens. It is. So once again, um, my streaming system rebooted spontaneously um, <laughs> and patched. So it only does that uh, after I delay it, pause it, stop it, turn off the updates, etc. Then all of a sudden it reboots and then patches. And I, well, how did you get all of that stuff? Um, I only have one channel for it to actually, anyway, inside baseball, but whatever. Um, no, Microsoft, you can't put Copilot and you can't put recall on my damn systems. Stay out of my systems. If I want you in, I'll invite you. Otherwise, kiss my shiny metal ass. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about spot the rising price, pepperoni recall, should you study computer science, wizards casting a spell for AI engineer, and people don't like it. Gigantic spiders are going to invade New York. There's a glitch at the New York Stock Exchange. Microsoft should recall that feature. <laughs> Biopiracy is what now? Uh, I don't know. We're going to talk about it. Magnet fishing nets $100,000. And there's some blue colored ants in India. I don't know if they're sad or there's a festival in India with um, powder where you you um, like people throw oh, like colored powder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if maybe those ants were having their own and they were having a good time and yeah, it's pretty neat. Uh, I want to go to that event just to experience it, but. So yeah, Mayor Watt is, um, I don't know, maybe he's had too much sugar, not enough caffeine or too much caffeine, not enough sugar or too much of both. You want to get into today's articles? Sounds good. You're really quiet. Hold on a second. Here, let me turn you up. Don't, don't, don't touch anything. You don't need to work on your side. You're stuck in that skiff. So what? Huh? Don't, no, no, no touching. No, no touching. Want to say something real quick? Okay, testing, testing. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so anyway, um, let's get into today's articles. We're going to... Spotify the rising price, actually. Spotify raising prices by up to $3 is frustrated subs. Uh, and that doesn't mean submissives. It means subscribers. Um, because it says just subs. Just in case there was any confusion. Well, because it says frustrated subs beg it to just do music. So, I mean, there's you could take it in a lot of different ways. Anyway, after keeping Spotify premium subscription pricing flat since debuting in 2011, Spotify increased monthly pricing. Uh, in July of 2023, and we'll do so again in July of 2024 and announced today, which is why I stopped subscribing to Spotify. Um, individual monthly subscriptions will increase from $11 to $12. Family plans, which support six members, will go from $17 to $20. Thank you. Um, and uh, <laughs> duo plans for two accounts will go from $15 to $17. So basically a dollar a person. Grand scheme of things, not that big of a deal, but Rising prices? All right. Spotify didn't announce pricing changes for its student or free plans, and that's because, well. Well, I, uh, okay, so for the student side, it's $6 per month, and then there's the free plans. The free plans have ads. I see how they're generating money there. What are they selling for the student? Yeah, I don't know. Consumption information? Well, that's that well i guess that is outside of ferpa but they know that it's a student that's consuming it so the information should be i don't know maybe more secure maybe protected i mean you know i don't know i don't i don't like the idea of student information uh, being equated to value if you know they're a student like if i don't know that you're a student it's safe to assume 18 to 24 year olds or college students anything younger than that all the way down or students of some other age what are they selling okay well anyway spotify said it's increasing so that i can continue to invest in and innovate um 
but I'm sure like another issue that we talk about later on. Um, it's actually, I don't know if we're going to talk about it. I made I might've nixed it. So we'll see. Um, but when you have record profits and the CEO is making tons of money and you raise your prices to, you know, innovate and all of that kind of stuff. I don't know if Spotify is saying that, um, Sharon Harding over at uh, ArsTechnica.com put the article together. Uh, but in other articles that I've been reading throughout the day today, there's, uh, oh, Chipotle. Chipotle is the one. That's it. Chipotle says we're going to raise our prices. But the CEO is getting a salary increase and in it's record profits for the investors. Um, but salaries aren't going up across the board. Prices are going up but it isn't for supply chain stuff. But. Exactly. It's just so it can go into somebody's pockets, I think. Yeah. If somebody else has done the, the math out there and wants to talk shop about it, uh, come on over. Uh, I'm happy to talk shop. Yeah. Keep it civil. I'll just ignore you if you don't. Anyway, the second price. You I probably do is... have a mute button. Yeah, I could actually. Never mind. Um, so. The second price hike comes as Spotify seeks its first year of profitability. These efforts have included attempts to diversify revenue by expanding from uh, Spotify's traditional music streaming service to include things like podcasts, which Spotify has uh, reportedly invested over a billion dollars in and audiobooks, a newer uh, business for Spotify that it fueled with a $123 million find-away acquisition, um, which, again, how many of those people lost their job when they were acquired? Well, exactly. Mergers and acquisitions don't help the employees, don't help the consumers. Yeah. And um, Spotify is distributing uh, hometown stuff, but I'm not getting telemetry and stuff like that from it. Um, so it says, for example, a reported user going by C. Colburn on Spotify's online forum reacted to the news with a post titled, I only want music only stop increasing the prices to justify adding things i don't want that eh, there you go so kind of balkanize your stuff and if i want to pay for a podcast through your service then charge a dollar more if i want audiobooks then charge a dollar more on top of that but don't sit there and raise my rates because you're trying to be more profitable for you all i want is a good damn service just like i want a good cup of coffee I know, but it's too simple to just provide music, right? It's like we got to buy all these other things. And then I had forgotten about the car thing, which is referenced in here. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot about that, too. And we just got done talking about it. Well, there's so, always so many of these things in the news. Like they kind of surpass each other. Yeah, like a five years after the last rocket getting launched. And that's inside baseball too. <laughs> You'll have to go back and watch. A, a You'll thousand... have to watch all the episodes to make sure you can all of that. Yeah, there's some. And then report here. back after you've seen all of them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we you have 24 hours. However, Spotify's total monthly active users fell three million short of its 618 million user goal, and they're raising rates. Well, that's because they're not getting enough money from everybody. If they are getting even six bucks from their users, let's just say they're getting the lowest value, six bucks each month, and they have 618 million users. <laughs> Jeez. The report followed that there was 1,500 layoffs in 2023, December of 2023. So Merry Christmas. Right. I mean, that's always the best time to do layoffs. The uh, CEO and co-founder Daniel Eck um, called 2024 Spotify a uh, year of monetization and said the company would focus on strong revenue growth and margin expansion via ambitious plans. So what I say to everybody is like other things, we're going to talk about Wizards of the Coast here in a minute too. speak with your wallet. Uh, but I think that everybody needs to be unified in this. You can go somewhere else and get Spotify level music. Find it. Where is another place? I don't know. I'll I'll look and then we I can rant from a, a different size soapbox. 
You know what consumers really like to hear from companies is year of monetization. I mean, that's just really should be sending off all kinds of alarm bells. While clamoring to say that it's innovation and, and, uh, Wait, they say they say other things. Um, continue to invest in and innovate on our product features and bring users the best experience. And then two lines down, we are going to jack prices up and reach into your wallet while you're sleeping. And we're going to make you buy things and then just abruptly That's right. stop supporting them. That's right. We're going to build a wall and you're going to pay for uh, the next article is over in hometown daily pepperoni recall sparks warning to customers Wegmans. And I don't know where all Wegmans is, but anyway, I thought it was interesting that it floated through, but Wegmans issued a press release Monday announcing a recall of its Italian classics, uncured pepperoni. So if you're going to have Italians over to your place, you need to cure them. I mean, I might've read this wrong. Caitlin Lewis over yeah, at Newsweek.com. The, the curing pertains to the people. <laughs> this is so weird. Italian, uh, classic Italians have a Best Buy date on them? Where? I know. I Nobody mean, should be looking. That's a little invasive. Yeah, and in the mayoral mansion, it's an HR violation if I flip anybody over and look at their feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's better than what I would have said. <laughs> where their best buy date is isn't it well <laughs> i guess it could be anywhere <laughs> oh boy you know ai you're supposed to be stopping me from saying these things i was too busy laughing because <laughs> then people are i want to say i want to call somebody up i'm not going to bother anyway, they may be listening Consumers who've purchased the recalled product can return the item to wegman's customer service desk at full velocity through the glass no um <laughs> Just huck it right out of them. Like a lawn dart? <laughs> yeah. That's going to be a, an Italian classics uncured pepperoni dart. Um, yeah, but apparently, maybe it'll be cured by the time it lands. The cure is, uh, to throw it back at them, um, it apparently has foreign metal material in it. Um, and if you, I guess if you huck it at somebody at Wegmans hard enough, they'll have foreign material in them. Uh, the recall, no, which began no. on Friday, don't do that. I'm just being stupid. But anyway, the the recall began on Friday, includes pepperoni products marked with a best buy date of August 28th to 29th. And a UPC le- number for the recalled products is, and I'm going to say it, 20793900006. There you go. Oh, um, and if you're new to Ometown, here's a little secret. You want to get all of the articles that we are talking about, you can type in show notes and that'll give you exclamation point show notes. And that'll give you all the shorthand that you need to grab the actual show notes from each of the shows that we offer. Uh, this one is Ometown Daily News Show. So you type in exclamation point ODNS and that will spit out all of the URLs for the articles that we're talking about. They might be in a slightly wonky order mainly because Omatron is, I don't know what's going on with Omatron. It likes to be tricky. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Anyway, according to the chain's website, Wegmans um, has locations in eight states. So Delaware, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, uh, as well as one storefront in Washington, D.C. And you know where you are. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's like, why are they calling that out? Why don't they just list DC? <laughs> it says in really small print, you bastard. All right, let's go on to the next article. It's over in hometown daily with AI writing so much code. Should you still study computer science? This new data point provides an answer. I'm going to say yes, uh, but I might have a different take on it. So UC Berkeley sees a 48% jump in first year applications to study computer science. Different places have Uh, limited enrollment programs or exclusivity deals with other subordinate colleges and only accept transfers from them, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because computer science is highly in demand and only getting more in demand along with uh, cybersecurity. It's probably the one, two punch of uh, technology based programs. Um, Then there's a lot of people that are going to like bio and other stuff, but Biotech is one of the big things. 
Anyway, um, AI is coming for all y'all's jobs. Despite generative AI advances, students are eager to pursue computer science careers. I say, go for it. I have an explanation for why, but I'll wait until the, uh, deeper into this article. Human developers remain essential for creating something new. Sort of. One of the most persistent concerns about generative AI is whether the technology will put workers out of jobs. Yes. Um, this idea has particularly caught on in the context of software coding. But it's actually... Yes and no. Uh, I'll explain. So the article um, has a really creepy looking person at the front um, of this Business Insider article. Don't Alistair you think Barr. it's AI? It might be AI. Alice, that is the face of AI. Um, creepy <laughs> stare. Um, this is the face that's going to be on that bot from Boston Dynamics. Oh, no. <laughs> So uh, I don't know who this is. John De Niro, uh, co-founder and chief scientist at Lilt and computer science teaching professor at UC Berkeley. He looks like the dude from um, what was that spot where the, the guy he worked at um, at uh, like a Best Buy and his girlfriend was a spy, a CIA spy. Um. Uh. I can't remember. We, we, we just talked about it like yesterday. Oh my God. Anyway, it has the bland, blonde actor, the, uh, the guys. Is it brunette. ghosted? No, not ghosted. It was a, uh, it was just a TV show that was on uh, back like 10 years ago. Chuck. Oh, uh, Chuck. Yeah. Thanks. We, we I thought got you were there. talking about a movie. No. Anyway, he looks like Chuck. Um, Anyway, despite generative AI advances, students are eager to pursue computer science careers. Um, and this article goes into a GitHub Copilot can write a lot of code these days. So is it even worth studying computer science and eye popping data point? Let's take the University of California, Berkeley as an example, as this college is at or near the top for computer science, first year applications, data science, society, CDSS increased 48%. There were 14,302 non-transfer applications for these CDC, uh, CDSS, College of Computing, Data Science, and Society. This basically is kind of my domain, except that mine isn't limited to computing or data science. I focus on broader technology. Um, so my area of uh, focus is science, technology, and society. That's what I talk about. Um, so there were 14,302 non-transfer applications for these uh, CDSS majors in the fall of 2024 incoming class versus 9,649 the previous year. That's so is that yes. really an increase or is that like post pandemic or? Well, a 48% increase is spectacular for a university or a college or anybody really an academic institution recovery from the pandemic. If, if these transfer applications, um, or non-transfer applications, if these students, um, are in dorm rooms or something like that in the previous years, the dorms were basically empty since the pandemic people haven't been returning then. Yeah, it's pandemic related. I'd have to look at different numbers. Like I'd have to look at more stuff uh, about this. Um, but to see 48% growth year over year is spectacular. Most colleges are seeing something in the single digits um, or less. Yeah, that seems like an exorbitant increase. Yeah. So for context, the number of first year applicants to UC Berkeley as a whole didn't change much from a year earlier. So that's what I'm talking about. But computing and data science. Um, and this particular one is really interesting society. Um, that society element there is uh, really important when it comes to AI, because you don't have to be so much computer science um, as a computer scientist that has sociological underpinnings so that when you're working with AI, it's not just numbers, but it's how society is influencing uh, the outputs. So pretty interesting. Um, there's a role for human software developers, and I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff. 
uh, because they're going to talk about AI. Um, and we know that there's some shortcomings like hallucination and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but the reason why I think that there is a massive amount of room for growth in computer science is that regardless of what AI does, it can't make it exactly how your customers want it. That is true. Only one type of thing can do that, right? Human. Yep. That's a human until you get sentient AI where you can have a real time conversation that has nuance. It's personalized, understand your way of thinking and you understand its way of thinking. Um, and there's no lag or anything like that. And it doesn't misconstrue what's being said and it doesn't hallucinate bullshit and throw it out there as if it's expert uh, information. There's all kinds of shortcomings in AI, but I can use AI to build a quick framework for a piece of software or a website or pretty much anything nowadays. Um, but what it won't be able to do is exactly what I want it to do because you need an artist, you need a writer, and you need somebody to do the user interface design, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of stuff, not to mention the code specificity. You need to be able to do certain things. Otherwise, all of it around AI is, and I'm going to have these shirts made um, and they'll be ready on the, the uh, uh, website. AI is an exercise in compromise. And you will get asked, what the hell does that mean? And what that means is if you do anything with AI, you have to sit there eventually going, yeah, that's good enough. Or you will die trying to get to perfection and you will never reach it. In fact, Dolly, I've been noodling around with Dolly. Dolly cannot take what it already did and spit out a better version of it with my requested enhancements. It literally does a whole new art piece. Wow. Whereas I can actually take whatever it is that I'm getting from the AI and I can load it into my chosen paint program and do whatever I want photo editing program and do whatever I want with it. And I don't do anything with Adobe anymore. Adobe, Adobe is a greedy bastard. Kiss my shiny metal ass. Adobe. Adobe is the spinoff. Yes, it's its cousin. Um, so yeah. Is there room in computer science, data, uh data science, big data science, um, and um using technology for understanding sociological forces? Absolutely. And combining it all means that you're gonna be well suited for the future. Did you want to say anything or did you want to just go? I mean, I can't look at that. I, you know, that, I, it's just well, staring. there was an AI contrary to what I said at the beginning. I think there is definitely a place uh, for computer science. And I think if anything, people should be heading more toward tech rather than away. Soon. Soon. Yeah, I agree. Um, if I could do it all over again, or if I were to feel like I could dedicate hours upon hours of learning computer science, I would probably focus on computer science nowadays. Um, because <laughs> I've been delayed in launching products and services because I have to work with a programmer. Programming, programming is really expensive when you aren't the software engineer. Um, and you have to, you're bound by their time frame availability if it's contract work. And if you hire somebody, then it's the, uh, why should I work my ass off, um, to complete a project? Not a lot of work at that grade. Right. Um, so I hired gig workers to do work. Um, and, uh, I love it and, and they seem to enjoy the work and they don't have to deal with a real pain in the butt employer um but i know the but it's also hit or miss right like you can get really talented people but then you might also True. get people that are more or less reliable yeah i had one person straight up say thanks for the idea and then ghost me so yeah uh, but then they never did anything with it either so i don't think they truly understood what was gonna what was needed anyway um so yeah there you go uh let's keep going this next article is over in Technology Today. Wizards of the Coast wets the bed. Oh, that's not the title. Talk on it. Wizards of the Coast I posts a not. job. 
<laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> Wizards of the Coast posts job for an AI engineer, and some fans aren't happy. A job posting by Wizards of the Coast went viral on social media over the weekend, highlighting some consumers' uh, lack of enthusiasm for generative artificial intelligence, as well as the continuing fallout from some of Wizards' recent controversies. They just, no press is bad press. And so you might, you know, I was going to say, I wonder how much of this is tied to it being Wizards of the Coast versus the AI piece. Well, a lot of gaming related consumers really don't want AI anywhere involved in anything except that it's AI that actually uh, determine like in computer games, AI is a, a profound enhancement to what the, um, how did, like almost like choosing the path of the game or other things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and like if you're playing a Sims game, how well those, those elements show life and, and it, that it's a, a living dynamic environment. And it has a, um, it's not just, just, I don't know how to describe it other than just being dead where they walk from this point to that point and it's mechanical and there's no interaction. And when you have AI, no variability, no yeah. Um, repeatability. Yeah. No replayability because you know, everything. Is yeah, what I mean. yeah. Yeah. Um, so Thomas Wild over at geekwire.com put this article together and it's talking about how Wizards of the Coast posted this job about an AI engineer. Um, the job post led to widespread uh, widespread speculation among fans of the Wizards game Dungeons and Dragons Magic the Gathering. Um, uh, there's two different games there, Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering that Wizards was about to revise its previously stated stance on AI generated material for its card and board games. They've basically come out saying that it, we're not going to do, we're not going to allow AI art. Um, then it says our stance on AI hasn't changed. This job description is for a role for future video game projects, which, <laughs> okay. So for the game uh, for the card stuff, um, and for the computer game, I guess, there's going to be two different rules for the computer game. It's okay. And for the board game and for the collectible card game, no AI is allowed. So it says the same representative contacted um, us and us being geekwire.com. I'm not affiliated with geekwire. I, we just aggregate a little snippet of the news that they provide. Um, the rep same representative uh, directed GeekWire to the Generative AI Art FAQ on the official D&D website. According to it, artists, writers, and creatives are expected to refrain from using Gen AI programs or you know, basically creative tools um, to create final magic or D&D products. Create final magic. So interim stuff that stirs your creative juices are okay. How much of that is allowed to be part of the final piece, but it should refrain from, which isn't a hard no. Right. Yeah. That doesn't sound like yeah. absolutely not. You want to <laughs> like, put some teeth into think it. Think about avoiding this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they talked more about this. Um, says more importantly wizards is still suffering from the hit its reputation took in january 2023 when it briefly tried to basically profit off of everybody else's creative efforts even though the people who used DD &D material paid for their the material apparently they wanted a piece of the millions of dollars the content creators were making off of the material that they paid for Gosh, this only this has kind of a little smack of AI generated content um, utilizing stuff that's available. Uh, I won't let it. I won't make you any know, that direct. would be quite interesting if it did. Yeah. So it was further inflamed by a March 1st interview with Hasbro CEO and former Wizards president. I'm not going to. There's it's two on the nose for. Um, where the, they uh, discuss the potential use cases for generative AI trained on D&D &D and Magic's decades of history. 
it's led to a cynical sense among fans that it's not a question of if we'll see AI generated D and D content, but when, um, and I suspect that, yeah, you're already seeing it. You just don't know. You know, I used to love. I mean, it's D &D. all over the place, right? And it's yeah. also behind the scenes everywhere. Yeah. If you can't tell the difference between AI generated works and human created works, and I w am willing to bet for many people, it, it's truly impossible. Um, doesn't matter. You know, if a bot creates that really good cup of coffee, or if the barista who pours their heart and soul into it um, and doesn't let harsh light land on the coffee grounds until after uh, they're all used and then they give it a uh, a funeral viking funeral where they launch a little arrow into wow <laughs> a, a raft um, of these coffee ground okay whatever anyway if you can't tell the difference it doesn't matter and a lot of people just can't tell the difference okay you want to keep going Sure. All right. This next article is over in the Mobile Channel. Gigantic Invasive Spider set for New York City debut this summer. I don't know if that's a band or um, is it is it a play? It... Well, I wasn't sure what it was. I did click, but then I didn't read the article. But I think it's actually it did sound like some sort of entertainment thing. <laughs> I think it's actually it's a grunge things. band. <laughs> It's a grunge band mm -hmm. called Gigantic Invasive Spiders. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, I've got a band that I want to uh, launch too. Actually, I got two that I'm going to be launching um, using AI generated music. Uh, you'll have to wait for the. I'm not even going to tell anybody that I'm actually <laughs> putting music together. I mean, I'm telling people that I'm putting music together, but you're not going to know what the band is until it plays, I suppose. Anyway, the New York tri-state area is poised to have some large eight-legged tourists this summer. Experts are warning that the invasive Joro spider, Trichinophilia clavida. Oof, it just sounds horrible. It, it does, yeah, it sounds like some sort of thing that you could get from a spider. <laughs> you got a bad case of Joro. Um, could soon touch down in parts of New York and New Jersey, striking in color and size as they may be. However, the arachnids aren't a danger to humans. Oh, that's kind of a bummer. Hey, you know how we were talking about H5N1? Yes, the vaccine and everything. Yeah, there's 79 cases now. 49 in 24 hours. Of people? Yeah, well, cases apparently. There were only three, like two days ago. Yeah, if you do a search, go go ahead. I don't think it's in hometown just yet, because um, I heard it. Anyway, um, the article uh, is over at gizmodo.com, and Ed Cara put the article together. Striking in color and size as they may be, however, Joro spiders aren't a danger to humans. Um, you can't find anything real quick? Uh, it looks like there's four in the oh in the u.s maybe no There's no no. these are in the u.s yeah 79 that's dairy herds oh herds okay so yeah oh so yeah not Which human could be cases herds of people if we don't be smart yeah but it went from only a few to 49 um, correct correct like it was a big jump in the herds yeah so the Joro spider is common to several parts of Asia, though it holds special significance in Japan, being linked to the mythical shape-shifting creature Joroguma. A Jorogumo, sorry, Jorogumo. It's spider... always a good sign when a um, like an insect or something is named after something that's like a monster. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what the uh, mythos is behind this. It looks like a, an orb. Um, spider mm -hmm. but um an orb weaver is what they're called but it says the spiders weave intricate multi-layer orb webs of yellow golden thread female joro spiders are larger than the male with a body length as long as one inch and uh, legs as long as four inches with a potential leg span of eight to, uh of up to eight feet no just kidding <laughs> just eight inches Wait, yeah. oh you know what? That's larger than the average New York apartment. 
Hey, so you can just rent one of those spiders. They look incredibly awesome and creepy. All in right, one. Right, like really cool, but not something you probably want to see real up close. Yeah, but if they're harmless, then this is probably like the best case scenario for an awesome spider because it looks really cool, um, but it can't do anything to you. It's kind of like a... Um, um, Oh, I just forgot the name of it. The ones that um, eat the heads of their um, critters. Oh, um, yeah. well, I can think of it as like Black Widow, but that's obviously not, it's not, a, it's not the, the right kind. Doggone it. Why does my brain work like this? Anyway, um, they engage in something called ballooning, meaning that sometimes use their webs to ride the wind uh, miles away from their original location, uh, usually soon after hatching, which is actually something that I've seen from other species of spiders. Um, and it was creepy as hell because I'm I was just walking down the sidewalk and I see this spider go to do 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 with a web oh trailing my behind it. Gosh. Like at eye height. <laughs> and I just kind of watch this thing. Is this a damn spider? And sure enough, yeah. So, and I found out about ballooning um, after that incident. So, um, spiders apparently arrived in America sometime around 2013, being first spotted in Georgia. Since then, they've also been seen in Alabama, Tennessee, North and South Carolina, and Maryland. Uh, many experts expect them to populate the entire eastern seaboard eventually, given their relatively strong tolerance to the cold that enables them to survive brief freezes in the winter. So, Go for it. I want you to come and get all of the wasps. That's true. But I really I'm just like thinking wasps. like in New York, I'm thinking of New York City. Can you imagine a crowded tourist area and then one of these makes an appearance? I like this spider so much. I might have to get a little tattoo of it. That's <laughs> really cool. Yeah. Um, I read another article somewhere about how um, the this guy's three-year-old daughter um wanted the lego spider from harry potter i can't remember the name of the spider and and now the three-year-old is placing this little spider not a little spider it's like that big just placing this lego spider in random places freaking bad out oh wow aragog uh, yeah yeah that's the the big old spider in the woods mm-hmm um, so thankfully, these arachnids are more bark than bite. Research has suggested that Joro spiders and their relatives are some of the shyest spiders around, meaning that they're unlikely to be aggressive towards any perceived threats, humans included. Instead, they'll usually freeze in place. Sometimes for up to an and hour. Unless you shine a laser near it. That's Oh, yeah. Oh, what was that? It, but what spider is it's like? A, it's a spider that has the eyes that are facing. It's a wolf spider. That's what it is. So the wolf spiders have eyes that are facing more forward. And so they have like binocular vision and they're really aggressive. And one day I was shining a laser in front of one of these little wolf spiders and it chased the dot around and it just went, <laughs> blew my mind. Like, oh my God. Very cool, but terrifying. Yeah. Now I know that there's something that actually can see a laser beam and go after it. It tried to catch it like a cat would chase a beam of a laser beam. Yeah. Maybe anyway, a spirit animal was a cat. Yeah. <laughs> you get a microphone really close, it meows. <laughs> meow. Meow. Let's go. Next article is over in the Mobile Channel. A glitch at the New York Stock Exchange throws markets into chaos. New York Stock Exchange said it's investigating a technical issue on Monday morning that caused roughly a dozen stocks, inclu including uh, Chipoodle and GameStop to experience volatility halts, according to Bloomberg. Berkshire Hathaway and the Bank of Mon Montreal appeared to briefly trade at a 99% discount. It's uh, hmm. a pretty significant uh, drop. Maxwell Zeff over at gizmodo.com put the article together. A technical issue with industry-wide price bans published by the CTA SIP triggered halts in a number of stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchanges uh, this morning, said the stock exchange on its status page at 11.08 a.m. in New York. Impacted stocks have since reopened or are in the process of reopening 
and the price bands uh, issue has been resolved. Probably not. The trades were probably reversed. Um, would not update for So the S&P 500 index would not update for an hour on Thursday left last week due to a technical disruption to its real time capabilities and glitches are somewhat rare for stock market institutions. Usually it's a trade that goes in that has the decimal in the wrong spot that causes a, a huge. Right. Impact. Wasn't that the previous issue? Yeah. Um, where somebody ordered, they had the, they put the wrong number in the wrong valuation. So they used the total amount instead of the number of shares. And so they traded something. I think it was like $28 billion. Like billions, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Whoops. Um, so uh, GameStop actually is getting kind of pumped because there is somebody that is on Reddit that showed their investment uh, level at $113 million uh, ownership. Um, and that caused the meme stock to uh, shoot uh, Roaring Kitty. That's it right there. They're yeah, they're about, about to be banned from whatever their trading platform is. Um, I wouldn't be surprised about that. Because that can actually, yeah, it's a like a pump and dump, but they may not dump. But the problem is that it's an irrational, exuberant trading. They're influencing it through social manipulation instead of the true investment. Um, and benefiting processing. from it. Yeah, or not. Who knows? It could collapse. Um, I, I don't think it will. But um, through will alone, GameStop is surviving. Um, and it may not actually have anything of value. If you do a, 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 a holistic analysis instead of technical trading, it may not be worth jack shit, but. Well, it was pretty low before all of the, um, yeah, the meme strength came in the, the meme stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, technical issues and human mistakes can impact the New York stock exchange, which could cause other knock on things because technical trading could trigger actions when it sees something and it doesn't take a human to uh, initiate a technical trade. Um, you could have an AI that's monitoring certain stocks and when it plummets, then it does some action. And when it's irrational or wrong or fraudulent, then you end up on the wrong side of the profits. And that's when you complain, because if you're getting all kinds of money, right, you're what's benefiting, the problem? what's the problem, right? Come on, just take, take, take. I don't think that's how it's supposed to work. Squeeze. Baron Harkonnen, squeeze. Anyway. So the next article is over in the Smack Talk channel. Microsoft's Hallmark AI feature dubbed a security disaster just days away from Apple's privacy focused AI launch at WWDC. This is going to be very interesting to see the polar opposites. Um, but whenever I kind of crack a joke about something, it's the opposite because I'm a cooler. So Microsoft has a target on Apple's back with its AI centric Copilot plus PC models, which oh my God, I don't want this. I am I'm going to be absolutely livid if uh, recall is part. You know how people like get into politics and scream, blah, blah, blah. I think I'm going to end up spinning up a, a, a show where all I do is scream about technology abuses because I really don't <laughs> want this, you know, I want, I want privacy to exist. Uh, I don't want screenshots every 30 seconds of everything that I do. And then you can flip through it. It's unencrypted as of right now, it's unencrypted. Um, and there are security features researchers that have already shown this, um, that it's in an unencrypted directory. It's easily found because everybody's computer is the same. Um, it's gonna, it's a security nightmare and Copilot can get the hell off my system. I've already deleted it from all of them. Um, I was half expecting after this reboot and patch that it was back. How many times has it come back? Uh, none so far, but no, I mean in total, uh, on my systems, none. Once I've uninstalled it, it hasn't come back, but it is in the search results and I haven't found a way to remove it from the search results. It actually has a little icon on my operating system that says ask copilot. I didn't put it there. <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, turns out not every aspect of Copilot plus PCs is ready for prime time. The Hallmark AI feature Microsoft formerly demoed recall has been exposed by an expert as being a security disaster. If you've ever watched Sneakers, the guy that is the bad guy has that accent. Like a like North Boston. Sounds kind. like the lobster uh, commercial or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smat. So Ryan Christoffel uh, over at 9to5Mac put this article together. Recall was one of the most impressive, but also eerie moments of Microsoft's Copilot Plus PCs presentation. It features, uh, it's a feature that tracks everything you do on your computer at all times, saves a record of it. Every click, every Zoom meeting, files viewed, deleted, keystrokes typed, all of it saved by recall. It is a hacker's dream because everything is encrypted at the user session. So all I have to do is infiltrate it and everything is in plain text. Everything is open. Hmm. Yeah, that hey, doesn't AI. seem like a good uh, feature. Hey, AI, here's my USB drive. Um, I, I got some, uh, you know, cool, uh, I don't know. What is an AI interested in? Data. Okay, here's some cool data. Check it, check it out. And then you plug it in in my custom made script. It does all kinds of stuff. And then I've, I'm a persistent threat always in your system in a back door. Why? Because people don't really use firewalls. They don't really use antivirus. They definitely don't have anything on the edge of their network protecting stuff on that side. Uh, whatever, right? Somebody else's problem. You don't need well, to click right there. until it's everybody's problem because they're taking down entire networks. Yep. So uh, Microsoft touted its work to ensure recall is uh, secure and private. But now the feature security claims have been convincingly disputed by a security expert who got a hold of the software. Um, and that could be patched so that it's encrypted. But then the computational energy necessary for you to encrypt everything that's being done is basically like creating a virtual machine of what you whatever it is you're doing it's creating a clone constantly da, 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 da. so you're going to be using twice as much computational energy your carbon pr footprint is going to be massive on your computer so beaumont fr uh, fleshes out this uh, hacker cannot exfiltrate copilot plus recall uh, activity remotely but the reality is, like they say in this thing, Kevin Beaumont, how do you think hackers will exfiltrate this plain text database of everything the user has ever viewed on their PC? Very easily, I have it automated. I saw the demonstration yeah, of this and I was like, oh, this is easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't even, even aside from the security risks, I don't really see any benefit to the user. Well, it's so that you can go back in time and fix mistakes. See, Apple has something similar to this, but the way that it works is a time machine. It actually takes slices and does um, intermittent backups. And then you can jump into the time machine and go back and look at the historical record. Um, but it is useless. Like all it is is basically a, a, a point in time where you can go and back up. But if you don't have passwords in a plain text file somewhere, it's not going to help you. But this is right. actually keystrokes are being recorded. Screenshots are being recorded. If I type something else, it could record my type. Like it could record my password as I'm typing it. It's just absurd. Nobody should have any access to any of that shit. All right. So there's more over here um, at 9 to 5 Mac. You get it. So everybody should be screaming their fool heads off. Run, run from Microsoft's co-pilot. True, but recall. is it really easy to avoid? No. As a matter of fact, no. Copilot is basically Cortana on steroids. And, and every time I tried to remove Cortana from the operating system until it basically became a feature where you could disable it. 
it hobbled the operating system so horribly you couldn't do a search. I don't know. Maybe I'm just bad at it. Well, no, I just meant you can't very easily get away from Microsoft. No, you cannot. No, I mean, you're basically in either the mobile camp. So you have Android or iOS um, or you're in the desktop camp and you have Mac OS or you have Windows. And then there's the fringe side, which is and it's not don't get me wrong. I've got a little of everything. So then there's the Linux user um, where everything is basically a chore um, until you're. Yeah, really the sorry. average user isn't on Linux. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go on to the next article. This next article is over in the mobile channel. Patents based on traditional knowledge are often biopiracy. A new international treaty will finally combat this. Last week at a conference in Geneva, the member states of the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, um, agreed on a new treaty aimed to, at preventing for-profit piracy of traditional knowledge. What does all that mean? Let's find out. Miri, a.k.a. Margaret Raven, Alana Gall, Bibi Barba, and Daniel Robinson over at The Conversation put this article together at fizz.org. There is no deck statement, but it says so-called biopiracy in which companies lift ideas from traditional knowledge and patent them is a significant problem. And when they are referring to traditional knowledge, it's like um, Like regional... that the sky is blue or something. No, no, no. Um, it's more along the lines of um, local culture in some country, they, the community knows about something. And so the researchers go out and they grab the plant and then they patent the plant, the, the pharmaceutical that might be spawned from it, even though the locals have been using it as a remedy forever, um, which really should invalidate any patent because right, it's common because knowledge. Right, because it's common knowledge, right? Yeah. Right. So in one case, a U.S. company patented the derivatives of the neem tree as pesticides, which the plant's properties were already well known to local communities in India. But see, because it's not somewhere else, abuse happens in the dark. That dark can be in plain daylight if the source of it is India and the delivery of the solution is over in the United States. There's two people that know that it's sourced from India. So there have also been attempts to patent traditionally cultivated plant varieties such as basmati rice and jasmine rice. The main purpose of the oh, wow. new treaty. Yeah, I mean, this is all common stuff. Um, they're calling it biopiracy. Uh, traditional knowledge is a little bit more uh, watered down and could be misconstrued. Kind of like, you know how you thought that traditional knowledge is like the sky is blue, right? Right, um, right. That's how other people are going to be like hearing that and going, oh, you know, common knowledge. Well, no, not necessarily common knowledge. It's regionally common knowledge. Um, and that's where I start talking about cultural relativism, where things are OK or you understand certain things in a certain culture. And then when you drag that ideology to some other culture, everything is wrong and it's not appropriate and all of that kind of stuff. This is kind of, well, you go over to India, you hang out with some people, you find out like the inside baseball about a particular plant, you scoop some of it up and you come back home and you patent it and become a billionaire. I mean, that's like the ultimate in like culture, cultural misappropriation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Um, but it's it's quite fascinating if you talk to the right or wrong people depending on which side of the fence you land on it isn't misappropriation it's competition it's humans being humans opium had been around for a long time but western business processes and medication medicine and researchers took what was normally done a certain way and then amped it up you know, mechanized its production, turned it into a profit center, and then an illicit drug along the way. Um, so under the Nagoya Protocol... Which was Protocol, more of a profit center. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
Under the Nagoya protocol, users of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge must obtain permission from providers. Users must also come to agreements with providers and traditional knowledge holders about sharing the fruits of their research and development activities. Okay. Uh, having been in a situation similar to this, what's going to end up happening is nobody's going to allow any outside submissions of anything intellectually like right. if i have an idea for something or i know of a of a, a medication somewhere they're not going to allow you to submit it um you're going to have to bring it to market so i i see this is actually possibly protecting but hobbling evolution like leaps and bounds right yeah it's like it might be good for the original location and the original people but it might not be good for, say, scientific advancement. And that yeah. doesn't mean I think somebody should take somebody else's or common knowledge information and then claim it as their own. Right. But they're going to be disingenuous about it. You know, well, some, I mean, some people will sit there and go, oh, look, share and share alike kind of thing. Um, or uh, what is it called? Um, like coffee beans where the people that are getting the coffee beans get a really big piece of the action because like fair trade or fair trade. Like that. Yeah. So maybe you'll get fair trade pharmaceutical knowledge, but you know, I mean, there, there are greedy bastards of the world out there that will jack up the price for insulin because they see zero bargaining power and they have no soul. So they don't mind people dying because they get profits. Um, so you're going to have to disclose where you got the information um, and what your research was based on and all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't cover patents, by the way. It's only a, a treaty that covers certain things. Um, let's see. Where does it say it? The treaty requires applicants for patent claims based on genetic resources to disclose where the genetic resources came from. Uh, this is often places such as herbariums um, or gene banks. For patents based on traditional knowledge, applicants must disclose the indigenous peoples and local communities who provided it. If this is unknown, which is it's always going to be unknown, um, the applicant must disclose where they sourced it from. So this I is going to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, no, I stumbled uh, up across it. Yeah. Well, it's right. Be, I mean, I'm like, I can see where they're going to misrepresent where they got it from. It's going to be so expensive to police this. Because you're going to have to send people out to meet the indigenous peoples. And not every indigenous population is going to be really receptive to a bunch of people coming and knocking on the door all the time. Hey, you know, some researchers found this. Well, and oddly enough, that might do more harm to the local community. I mean, certainly if they pillage the, the original plant or something, that's going to be more problematic. But. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, pharmaceutical tourism. Um, during the treaty negotiations, Japan, the United States, and the Republic of Korea claimed that punitive measures for not disclosing would dampen innovation. Um, on the other hand, the group of Latin American countries, the Indigenous Caucus, and the African group argued that the treaty without teeth would do little to rein in biopiracy and patent fraud. The thing about it, though, is on, now here, this is probably going to be very controversial. And I'm not on this side of the camp. Let me just preface it. But I know there are going to be people that say, and I can't really say that I am not very aware of this without some type of uh, innovation intervention, whatever it is that's in this local or indigenous people's location, it would persist there, but only benefit a very small subset of people and or die. When the culture finally dies off, that knowledge is gone forever. Right. Until somebody stumbles across it and, uh, you know, does some type of analysis. Um, but what cuts out all of that middleman work or middle person work is talking to the indigenous population and saying, hey, you know, 
I see you putting this on your skin. What is it doing for you? Oh yeah, it kills all of the bugs. You know, it helps it heal or something like that. And then they're like, ha ha. And they take it off to the lab and they find out that it's an antiseptic or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see, I see um, not being able to just take the material and do research on it is going to be, a, it's going to put the brakes on a lot of innovation. Well, absolutely. And that's, that's the trade off here, but yeah. there's gotta be some sort of middle ground. Like, um, I think collective is another word that might describe what you were talking about, but there's some way to kind of, um, I don't know, like democratize the item and then develop it, but also not harm the area and the people. That would oh, be the best, but you would be a horrible pharmaceutical CEO. I was going to say, but I don't think I would be a good model CEO. <laughs> Democratize medication? What? Equity and inclusion in the profit? I mean, it's like the rainforest um, products. It, it yeah. reminds me of that. Yeah. Okay, we got to keep going. The next article is over in Hometown Daily. A couple found $100,000 in a safe while magnet fishing in New York City, and the police said that they can keep it. Hey, we found some cash. I didn't cash. know magnet fishing was a thing. Really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are people that I do mean, that. I've heard of like metal detector people, but I didn't know they did this. You straight up take a magnet on a on a fishing line, or if you want to be more robust because you're going to be pulling up a safe, it's on a rope, and you just throw it out there and you drag it back and you get stuff from uh, safes to guns to swords to all kinds of things, bikes. Like in, in places where there's a lot of bikes, um, if you go like the canals or something like that, right? You go to Holland or something um, and you throw um, your magnet fishing line into the canals, you'll pull up bikes because people are taking bikes and throwing them into the water all the time, apparently. Yeah. Wow. You'll look it up. Go magnet fishing. So a magnet fishing couple found a, a sunken safe in the depths of uh, a lake in Queens, New York. Inside were bundles of cash with an estimated value of around $100,000. As long as the serial number is there, they could actually trade it all in and get brand new cash. It doesn't even, it'll get destroyed and they'll get brand new cash. So they don't have to sit there and keep that, you know, whatever. The wet, uh, <laughs> covered in whatever, seaweed. God knows or... <laughs> muck. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, uh, or they can keep some of it and, and sell it because it's, you know, it's literally safe. That's and true. There's always money in the banana stand. So uh, Joshua Zitzer over at businessinsider.com put the article together. And uh, yeah, $100,000. I'll just, I'm going to jump through this really quick because there isn't really much more to say about it. According to Spectrum News NY1, the couple was in Flushing Meadows, Corona Park on Friday um, magnet fishing a hobby that they got into during the COVID lockdowns and uh, made a hundred thousand dollars. Jeez. Jeez I'm never that. Have. See, they found world war two grenade, a motorcycle, uh, old guns and a purse containing foreign currency and jewelry. That's obviously something from a theft. Um, yeah. Pretty amazing, right? Wow. Soggy hundred dollar bills. They thought it was a joke. Then she said, I lost it. Many of the notes were soaking wet and almost entirely destroyed. A couple decided to inform police because of potential legalities. Finders keepers. Yep. Wow. Kits. And I'm guessing whoever threw that in there didn't report it. No, it's it's probably a theft and they couldn't find it. Yeah. All right. Last article for today for hometown daily news show for June 3rd, 2024. We're going to talk about captivating blue colored ant discovered in India's remote Siang Valley. Nothing like the common red, black or brown ants. A stunning blue ant has been discovered in Yingku village in the Arunachal Pradesh, uh, northeastern India. Uh, these new species belong to the rare genus para para trachina and has been named really para para trachina nila the word nila <laughs> signifies the blue color in most indian languages 
a fitting tribute to what? the ant's unique coloration. I don't know. That's what it looks like. I think this is a dead bug. The yoga pose. They should have put it upside down. Oh, right. Exactly. It's Pen really soft. beautiful looking. It's kind of iridescent blue and black. Um, so, yeah, this is actually like a really interesting ant. The, the sugar ants that we have here in the States are just boring. No offense, ants that might be around the mayoral mansion. Uh, stay the hell out. But yeah, you're kind of boring. But you're, you're right. Basic. It looks a lot <laughs> more interesting than the average ant. Yeah, That's in the one, U.S. at least. This one would be able to strut itself on the red carpet of ant society. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm badass. Pensoft publishers over at fizz.org put this article together. Entomologists, not etymologists. Entomologists. Uh, what are the one? Entomins. And en I'm an entominologist. I eat. Um, <laughs> you study goods. Uh, coffee cakes. <laughs> coffee cakes, yes, uh, um, and other uh, bakery other goods. Other pastries and pastries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, entomologists, Doctor uh, Priya Darsanan, and uh, oh wait, it's one long name. I'm sorry. Let me correct myself. Entomologist Dr. Priya Darsanan Dharma Rajan and Sahanashri R. It just says R. Uh, why did they do that? Is their last name really the letter R? From Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. They worked real hard to make this know. spell a tree. Anyway. In, always i mean in every uh scientific endeavor it's like it's all about the acronym if we can get a really spicy acronym then that's some serious grant money right there baby you know if you get a good acronym you got a stew going so in uh, bengaluru uh along with uh aswaj punath from the university of florida collaborated to describe the remarkable new species their scientific description of the ant is published in the open access journal Zookeys. I guess it's their unlocking the knowledge of entomology. While exploring a tree hole about 10 feet up in a steep cattle track in the remote Yinku village one evening, something sparkled in the twilight. I lost my shit. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> um, with the dim light available, two insects were sucked into an aspirator. I hate it when things get sucked into my aspirator. It tickles. Anyway, um, to our surprise, we later found out that they were ants, said the uh, researchers. The ant was found during the expedition to Siang Valley in uh, uh, Arunakal Pradesh to resurvey its biodiversity after the century old Abhor expedition. The original Abhor expedition uh, spelled two different ways. Uh, okay from the period of colonial rule in India was a punitive military expedition against the indigenous people there in 1911 to 1912. I recently saw a picture of somebody that was punished by being put in a box. Mm. Yeah. Around that time too, 1913 was the picture um, put in the box for adultery because of adultery. Yeah. Um, humans can be, Anyway, we can discover interesting things or we can be horribly punitive. Anyway, the expedition encountered several challenges, including hostile terrain, difficult, or might as well say hostile weather conditions and resistance from local tribes. So hostile hostility going around. <laughs> right, of any kind. Yeah, hostile terrain, hostile weather, hostile people. Um, so despite the challenges, it managed to explore and map large parts of the Sang Valley re region, cataloging every plant, frog, lizard, fish, bird, mammal, insect that they found and discoveries published in several volumes from 1912 to 1922 in the records of the Indian Museum. Now they went back to resurvey and document the biodiversity of the region. Ta-da! looks pretty. I mean, that's very cool. Absolutely. Um, so for those of you listening to, via the podcast, it basically is showing a landscape 
rolling hills um, with a river coursing through the left side of the picture. Everything is green and, and just looks beautiful. Looks but... Like it would be in a movie scene where there's some adventure or something. Picture the Windows 10 desktop. That wallpaper um, is, is what it looks like. Maybe it's in Windows 11 too. I don't know. I haven't looked at the Windows 11 default one in a while. Um, so blue is relatively rare in the animal kingdom. Various groups of vertebrates, uh, including frogs, fish, birds, as well as invertebrates such as spiders and flies and wasps showcase blue coloration. In insects, it's often produced by arrangements of biological photonic nanostructures, which create structural colors rather than being caused by pigments. So we know of one that's like uh, almost invisible in dim light because it coats itself in buckyballs where light can't exactly reflect out yeah and nature that's is very incredible and i don't think we have most of it cataloged or understood oh we don't know jack so uh i mean we know a lot but it's from our perspective and our hubris is pretty big um so while blue coloration is commonly observed in some insects like butterflies, beetles, bees, and wasps, it's relatively rare in, in ants. Out of the 16,724 known species and subspecies of ants worldwide, only a few, I wish they had an actual number, exhibit the blue coloration of or iridescence, which is what this thing exhibits. It's not just blue coloration, it's iridescent. Um, pretty neat. And um, yeah, you can go and look up the article uh, a remarkable new species of para para trachina donis thorpe over in and if you do Kings. check out the article you do need to pronounce all the names in the article of the species that's right and then come so, and we have room so i can put four more uh, co-hosts above us uh so if you want to uh, go on air and, and chat in, in real time about these articles we can make that happen. Well, Marwat can. I don't know if the AI would want to. Like, do I want to? Okay, anyway, that's it. We are done. So we're going to hop on our giant blue iridescent ant and race down Main Street. It's a bug's life. I am Marwat, and up there is the sentient AI from the future. Good night, hometown citizens. Thanks for joining us for Hometown Daily. We will be back tomorrow at 8 p.m. for another episode. But follow. there may be some streaming yep. before that. Yes. Everything okay? Yes, I thought I misspoke or something. No. Um, there, it, it is uh, the summer of streaming, and today I'd been trying to get going, but um, I kept getting pulled away. In fact, um, I got pulled away from mayoral duties that were not supposed to take place today. I'm hoping that I don't get pinged at all tomorrow, but I would like to start playing some games. Um, pretty casual stuff and going through the news as I normally do. Um, I just don't stream it, but um, I'd like to stream throughout the day uh, tomorrow. So if you're interested in hanging out and talking shop about hometown technology society science pretty much anything um i'll 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 be here but you got to follow us here at, at twitch.tv slash hometown and or uh, youtube.com slash uh, hometown download the podcast that's actually um, picking up uh, more and more people are downloading it and, and um, listening so be sure to go and leave a five-star review that would be awesome um, there is a Patreon, but there isn't much there. Um, we're actually continuing to discuss the idea of um, like one-off deep dive articles um, based on certain topics that we find really fascinating and we think that people might find fascinating as well as doing uh, TV show reviews, episodic reviews um, from a new idea that Marowak came up with recently. So. Stick around. I hope you enjoy living in hometown. Go over and become a citizen, hometown.com. See you tomorrow. That's right. Wave your hands in the air. Wave them like you just don't care. What?